Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, book of Matthew, chapter 11 here in a moment. You know, Christ, um, two of John's disciples came and asked him, is this the advent or is there one to come? John wanted to know. He was in prison. And then Christ lets you know how happy he was with John the Baptist. He says, what what did you go out to hear? A reed in the wind? No. John was straight on. But John taught straight on, too. He, he told the Kenites, he called them a generation of vipers in one book. So he was very stern in bringing repentance for sin. And then Christ comes um, gently and tenderly teaching salvation to sinners and to the Gentiles even uh, that would hear. So. With that thought in mind, the ground laid so you'll understand the next few verses. Let's start with chapter 11, verse 16, a word of wisdom from our Father. And verse 16 reads, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. I mean, here they're, they're hanging out at the mall, so to speak, okay, 17, and saying, we have piped unto you, and you have not danced. Um, we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. We, we wanted to play wedding. We piped and done the wedding dance, but you wouldn't dance. And then we piped and for mourning to have a funeral, and you wouldn't mourn. Um, he's liking this generation, okay? Meaning, they don't know, come here from Sikkim. That's what it really means, the people as far as the Word of God is concerned. Verse 17, and say, uh, verse um, 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he had a devil. In other words, it was they, they wouldn't play that part. 19, the Son of Man, that's Christ, came, eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, wisdom is vindicated uh, by her children. That is to say, the children have wisdom and the children that don't. Children that don't, they're not going to vindicate justice. They're going down the wrong path. But wise children in the Word of God, not wise in the ways of the world. Totally two different things, basically. Verse 20, as we continue. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Um, and, and so it is that um, he said, you, you're, um, you men can um, justify your inconsistency by lack of knowledge. That's what it amounts to. You don't know whether, where, whether John was a four, you see, why would Christ say this? Well, um, Malachi, which means messenger, my messenger, they were warned that God would send this messenger, and John was in the spirit of Elijah. And, and um, in Isaiah, the great book of Isaiah, he told of the forerunner that would come and warn of the coming of the Son of God, that is to say, the Messiah. And they should have known these things. Had they had wisdom in God's Word, they would have expected Christ. And now he's saying these cities, they should know it too if they've been studying God's Word. That's what basically it's leading up to. Verse 21 to continue. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Um, that's, 
if they had seen the healings and the, the um, overall casting out of demons and so forth, they, they, would have, they would have believed. And actually these would have been Gentile nations as well. A little bit of shame going on here. And Bethsaida is the house of the fish, which means, um, uh, which is a sign of Christianity. Verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Why? Because when God gives much truth, he expects much. And certainly, if had, uh, had it only been the word, but it was the deeds also, the healings arising from the dead, and um, the, the baptisms with the spirit of the living God, and yet people would uh, continue to, to go awry when they didn't have this entire inside. Verse 23, and thou Capernaum, this is a city of consolation, Christ was there a lot, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have, it would have remained unto this day. It would not have been destroyed. They would have seen the miracles. I suppose what Christ wants you to know, do you believe in his miracles? They were witnessed by many people. The very touch of his hand, the very touch of being there and, and performing miracles gave documentation. He was the Son of God. He was Messiah. He was Savior. Verse 24, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And, and so it is. Um, and it is so obvious when people see truth. Many times it is so easy to pass it off. Well, it, it just happened. Maybe you were even praying for it and your prayers were answered and you thought, well, maybe it was just an accident. That when, you know, there are no accidents, basically, in prayer. When you are wise in the Scripture and in following Almighty God, he, he, you're His child. He has every hair on your head numbered, as, as we learned in the last lecture. And, and he, means to, he means the love that He gives to His children from the bottom of His heart. That's why it is so precious to observe those teachings of Christ and the miracles and even miracles today that are performed through the Holy Spirit, that's to say the Spirit of God, Almighty God, then that causes one to believe and to become wise in God's Word rather than wisdom of the world. Those that have ears to hear, let them hear, and those that have eyes to see, let them see. Seeds planted will grow in minds of wisdom. Verse 25, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, that's to say in the world, and hast revealed them unto babes. Uh, they, you revealed them in, unto little children, your little children, why? because it's common sense. And many times the whys and the ways of the world cannot see nor understand that that is just simply common sense, that that is natural. They have to take a different course and, and um, that uh, blemishes. This is one of the reasons that um, they will mock Christians today. Is th they're, they, um, their eyes are blinded to the true wisdom that brings forth God's blessings. So naturally, they feel in all their wisdom that God doesn't bless, and rightfully He doesn't, because He doesn't bless a fool. And if you're wise in the world and ignorant in God's Word, you're a fool, because you are toying with losing your eternal life. Verse 26, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, uh, it is in God's sight, um, it is good even that, as he would say in Romans chapter 11, 
Uh, some he gave eyes to see, and others he put the spirit of slumber upon that they would not uh, be converted. Why? Because they, they couldn't make it anyway. But that's why we have the millennium. I know if you don't understand that, put it on the shelf. We'll talk about it later. 27, verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. In other words, God's elect are chosen. They, well, that sounds very unfair, some might say. No, no, they earned the right in the first earth age, as it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age. Why? Because you withstood Satan there at the rebellion. And, and God does predestinate those souls and calls them his elect. And his elect he always blesses. Uh, and, and so it is. But when those elect are revealed, then the planting of seeds of truth goes to those that have freedom of choice. Why? That's the whole purpose is to bring people back to the Father that have uh, allowed themselves to be caught up in the ways of the world. Verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This means, rest means I'll give you a pause in life down to the bottom the etymology of the word, whereby you can rest a moment, consider, meditate, and understand. Rest also, not this particular word, but means Sabbath. And Christ is that Sabbath. He is the one that brings us that rest. Uh, and, and you should take this to heart totally and completely. If you labor and you're heavy laden, talk to him. Let him know it. Come to him. And, and um, talk, that takes, th that takes um, action on your part. To come to him, you must go there. You do that by talking to him, by letting, you know, letting him know that you love him and let him know what your problems are. And he reaches out and touches you, touches your life. He cares when you care. Further instruction, listen carefully, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. I mean, into your eternal, eternal soul and eternal life shall you have. Uh, what You have to understand a little bit here about uh, agriculture to understand this. What is a yoke? A yoke or a collar, a collar for a horse and a yoke for oxen, is usually about four inches wide and fit to the curve of the neck of the animal and a collar about that wide fit to the shape of the horse's neck that the tugs which the work comes from, the pull, are uh, fastened to hames, whereby they are not just a rope around the horse's neck that would cut and dig in when you pull the load. When you're heavy burdened and you don't have the Lord, you're cutting yourself really in a way. Not literally, but spiritually many times. You're, you're hurting yourself to not have His help. Because He can, if you pray to Him, and lean upon him and use the wisdom of his word, it lightens that load just as a collar lightens the load for an animal. It lightens your problems. And, and um, what does it say here? It says, learn of me. How do you do that? His word, he sent you a letter. He sent you a letter because he loves you. And when you crack open that letter and read it, it's full of advice on how to ease that burden and how to be successful. Actually, success comes with the blessings of God. And without the blessings of God, success is short-lived because it's usually evilly come by. Uh, but learn of me, that's part of, that's part of the instruction. That takes action again on your part, is to simply love your father enough to read his letter and, and pause a moment if you must 
for understanding. If you can't understand, then pray for understanding. He will give it to you. Why? Because he says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. I'm very humble. I've got time for you. That's what he's saying. And you shall find rest unto your souls. And so it is. You, you will find that rest. How precious it is. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, he makes it, he really helps and he makes it very easy for you. Uh, this, in this troubled time right now, this becomes extremely important because uh, the, with the situation in the world at this time, then certainly there is, much, there is much burden. Why? Because it's a hardship on many people. But I assure you, God always takes care of his own when they search him out, when they learn of him, and in his lowly and meek, humble self, gentle, loving, he reaches out and blesses you, whereby uh, you find that the yoke you put on doesn't weigh anything at all. It alleviates the load that you have on your mind and certainly gives you a lot better quality life by loving him. That's a precious scripture and, and uh, how precious it is when you lean upon it, learn from it, and exercise uh, the very word of God in your life. It makes your life a lot easy. Pause, rest a moment, think, talk to him, and your burdens, he, he instructs, and gives you wisdom enough to be able to handle it. It'll make the load a lot easier. Chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And naturally, here it is, um, uh, on, on uh, the Sabbath where you're by traditions of man, you're not to do any work without, uh, but certain people do work on the Sabbath and that's the lesson you're going to learn here. Verse two, but when the Pharisees, they're always hanging around, see, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, behold thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Oh. Verse 3, listen carefully. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? And what is he talking about? First Samuel chapter 21 along about verse 6. I'll say it again. First Samuel 21 about verse 6. Uh, the, uh, David goes into the synagogue, the temple itself. And he asked the priest if there was any bread there, and he said, only the showbread, which is for priest. And, and David said, my men are clean. And which means what? They were, he, was, he was a prophet and a priest himself. Uh, Acts chapter two in the New Testament declares that David was a prophet. And and uh, so the men that were with him were of the priesthood also, used of God, directed by God. So it was legal for them to partake of the showbread. It would tell you in 1 Samuel that only priests can partake of that that is holy. Well, do you understand what's happening here? Messiah, the Son of God, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and his disciples, meaning student priest, are eating that that God provided. They have every right, for you see, priests must work on the Sabbath. It is their destiny, it is their purpose, and it is to totally lawful. That's what the point Christ wants to make to you. Verse four to continue. And he entered into the house of God this, he's referring to Samuel now, and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. And there, of course, is your answer, all right? It is lawful for a priest to eat it. Verse 5, Or have you not read in the law, 
how that on the Sabbath day, Sabbath days, the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. I mean, they, they partake of it and they work on the Sabbath, but they're blameless. Verse six, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. I mean, the Son of God was there, the Messiah. Verse seven, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You could not have blamed us for you don't know that the Messiah was walking right before them. And here, uh, you can really, uh, you hear me quote Hosea 6.6 6 a lot, okay? And when, when you quote that, it says, God says, hey, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. And we see this love going forth to the priest uh, desired. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And so it is. How, well, how, how do we know that? From Colossians. You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it for you, though. Th this is the chapter in Colossians chapter 2 uh, concerning that. I'm going to pick it up with the 14th verse and read for a moment. This is speaking of Christ and what he accomplished, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. In other words, many of these things were nailed to the cross. Why? Because Christ became those things. He fulfilled them. Verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in himself, that is to say. In other words, over principalities, evil spirits, over Satan himself, Christ triumphed. 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, that's to say a Sabbath, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Don't let them judge you. Especially if you're one of God's elect, you're chosen. Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, by the, but the body is of Christ in Him. Okay. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and, and doing the traditions of men. Christ became those things. So herefore, you can see the fact that Christ himself puts election upon his chosen whereby they have the right, and they are not to be judged by food. However, you're never going to, most, most of God's elect, you're not going to get them to break the food laws. Why? Because they know they're blessed when they maintain that. But they can partake of that food whenever it is placed before them. Uh, I, you might, to, to quell any thoughts that are questions that might arise from that, no bad food, no unclean food was ever brought into the temple in the first place. Everything brought in was food for the priest uh, to partake of. Now, returning again to chapter 12, verse 9, and verse 9 reads, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. He didn't hide anything. Verse 10, And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, they're trying to trip him up, see, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? They're, uh, you know, trying to trip the Son of God. How about that? Verse 11, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? In other words, that, that was his livelihood. And sheep are always symbolic of our people. Don't forget that little thought as we go along here, okay? 
And naturally, they're going to have to answer, well, of course I would. It's my sheep. Verse 12. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. It's um, it, whose sheep ye are. It is lawful to do good things on the Sabbath day. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you through traditions of men that make void the word of God. Verse 13, Then said he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Now, I want you to see how intelligence and uh, wisdom are performed by our Savior. He, he didn't touch the man. Didn't touch him at all. They cannot accuse him of healing him. Okay. He simply gave a command, stretch forth your hand. And the man stretched forth his hand and was healed. So they are in a quandary. You see what Christ did to them. He healed the man on the Sabbath day and did it in such a manner that they can't even accuse him. And basically, that's what they want to do. Verse 14, And then the Pharisees went out and held the counsel against him how they might destroy him. Now you see, there's the kind of community you don't want to get involved with. I mean, for a good deed such as the... Son of God himself telling this one, stretch forth your hand, meaning you're healed. Then they're going to destroy him for that? That shows you how you must be very careful in this world even today. It lets you understand why some talk against Christ's church. It tells you how some talk against Christ himself and how indeed they speak against Christians. Um, that's the kind of world you're in today. But then that's not new, so it was even at this time. They want to destroy him. Why? Because they are claiming to be priests and followers of the living God, but they can't heal people. They claim to be priests, but they can't uh, heal the sick or cast out demons. They can't cut that. So naturally, people are beginning to follow Christ because he can do it. That is to say, work miracles, and they can't. So there's a little jealousy going on here. People are walking out of their houses of God, so to speak, and following the Savior. Verse 15, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. I mean, left nothing out. It's no wonder they followed him. They could get some action there, and the love of God touching them. 16, and charged them that they should not make him known. Uh, 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying this would be Isaiah. Verse 18, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, he's quoting here. It is time for the Gentiles begin to begin to hear the word, and after the crucifixion, he would bring all nations in that would believe upon him, whomsoever will, and to find that salvation that he would bring. This is his message, is salvation. Gentle, with common sense, humbly, Christ brought it forth. Not, not as some superstar or something of that nature, but taking the message to those that would believe. And in the natural sense, what a Savior he is. Verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry. He's not going to cry out nor um, is he going to clamor. 
Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He's not going to be yelling anything or shouting. Verse 20, a bruised wheat reed, a bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. This, have you ever seen a broken reed? I mean, it, it is so easy to, uh, fragile. Just, just touch it and it'll, it'll continue breaking. He's going to handle that reed in such a way it won't, it won't even, uh, a broken one that is damaged, it will not harm it. And probably the greater miracle is smoking flax shall not be quenched. When a lamp that has a wick begins smoking, you have to trim the wick to get it to burn clean. When, when that flax is smoking, it's very sensitive, burned. And he takes it and he can trim it without quenching the fire. That's how gentle he handles things. And, and uh, when, when he touches your life and when he deals with you, he does it in that same gentle way. Even when you're broken, he can, he can repair you. He can put your life back together. And, and when your light that shines from him grows dim, he can touch you and trim that wick and your light brightens up whereby you are an inspiration to those around you for hearing his word. How precious the teachings and the simplicity and common sense that our Lord and Savior would bring them forth. All right, um, we'll stop there for today. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. If the and uh, and uh, we'll, um, Father's blessings will be right back with you. No, And we thank him for that. Now, those of you that listen by short wave uh, around the world, it's always good to hear from you. And again, I want to say, don't ask a question about a reverend or a denomination or an organization, okay? We're not going to judge people because God is our judge, and we're going to let him take care of that. Now, prayer requests don't need the number. We're going to get right into the altar of God around the world. Father, we come before you. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen, amen. All right, question time. And we're going to go with Sue from Kentucky. Uh, Pastor Murray, I hope you don't get upset with me for asking the same question again. Oh, we closed with this in the last lecture. But this is so important to me. I just can't understand why that Mr. Bullinger makes the comments that he does on certain scriptures in the Companion Bible. Some of these are Genesis 127, creation postponed until 2-7, and sounds like he doesn't believe in the eighth day creation. That's true. And Matthew 10, 21 caused them to put to death. And, um, and Matthew 24, taken for peace and blessings and left for judgment and forsaken. Well, it, you know, um, Dr. Bullinger was a, a fantastic scholar of the languages. 
He was the only Christian that Ginsburg allowed to proofread the Masara. That, that may not sound like much to you, but to a student of God's Word, that's fantastic. Um, but he died in 1915. He died before Israel ever became a nation. He, did, he died before airplanes flew and communication increased of what it is. And, and um, so there, were, there are things, you know, that you have to cut a little slack on. The reason I still recommend it is the very reason that you caught it. I feel I teach well enough and in the simplicity that Christ teaches that you spot those errors anyway, and it's kind of like a te pop test. I like to give that pop test to people to see whether they do catch it or not. And certainly um, a man that began his work back in the 1800s and passed away in 1915, we, we can surely cut a little slack, for God has certainly blessed, as he would say in Daniel chapter, the great book of Daniel, that wisdom would increase in, in the last days. Okay, very good. Um, you passed the pop test, you caught it. Okay, Brian from Georgia. My question is, will Father forgive me if I have made any mistakes in talking about the Bible with people or overloading uh, uh, one's donkey? Well, you know, always do your homework. There's nobody perfect, but uh, make sure you're not misleading someone by doing your homework, by studying the Word of God. And when, when you teach something, like you will hear me say sometimes, this is an educated guess. That means I, I am speculating, so to speak, but I'm letting the student know that I am. Otherwise, if I make a declaration, I can document that from Scripture. So that's the way you teach. You give people that opportunity to take advantage of what you have discerned in years of study by giving an educated uh, summar summarization or guess, if you wish to put it that way. But always do your homework and pray that God gives you the truth. If a person waited till they were perfect to teach or plant seeds, there would never be any planning because none of us are perfect. A doctor from Pennsylvania, I enjoy listening to you reading the verses of the Bible. I would like for you to read Mark 10, verses 11 and 12, also verse 19. And what the good doctor is probably concerned about, those verses have to do with if you are divorced and have a living husband or wife, uh, if you remarry, you're in adultery. That's, that's what uh, the Word says. Now, that is someone that's living in sin. They divorce in sin. They never ask for repentance because if they were Christians and living a Christian life and they went to the Father and asked forgiveness, do you believe that the Father would give them forgiveness? That's the price Christ paid on the cross. And certainly divorce and adultery are not the unpardonable sin. Nowhere can you, can, will you ever find they're unpardonable. Therefore, if one repents, it's pardoned. And they become a new creature. And they are free to remarry. You would rob people of the strength of Christianity, the gifts from God, if you were to teach otherwise. You put limits on Christ's ability to forgive sin because there are many people that marry too young to really be married for one reason or the other. And they're not, they are not fully aware of what Father's Word says. They make errors and God makes allowances so anytime you can document to me that um, divorce or adultery are the unpardonable sin, and I can guarantee you they're not, okay? I know what the unpardonable sin is, and it's not that. Okay? You'll find the unpardonable sin in Luke 12, 10. 
But anyway, be that as it may, good doctor, uh, carry on. Uh, Mary from North Carolina. First, I want to thank God for revealing your teachings to me and my husband. I was so confused before. I prayed to God to show me the truth and he led me to Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, there was someone the other week that was talking about a habit he had and what to do. Well, I had a habit, a drinking habit, for about 30 years. I wanted to stop and better myself, but I couldn't. And I heard you one day talking about how to talk to God and to be honest with Him. So I started praying and talking to God and asking Him to give me the strength to stop. I talked to Him every day. At first I felt I was not worthy of Him to listen to me, but I never gave up. Then one day I woke up and I stopped drinking and smoking. I no longer have a desire to anymore because I know now that He hears me when I talk to Him and I know that He loves me. So I think the key is to never give up and let Him know you really want to stop. Well, bless your heart, Mary. That's, that's well written and that's exactly what I teach. Don't make God promises you can't keep. When you see you're having trouble and can't handle it, ask His help. And, um, and, and, and do it, uh, and he will do it. He, every hair on your head is numbered. Thank you for the letter. Uh, Ed from Texas. I'm trying to explain to a friend of mine in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. The word world, the world was, the word was, should be become, became rather. He's looking for backup. Maybe you can explain this better than me. I'll record it and let him watch. Well, your answer will you will find in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. It's one place because it simply states there that God did not create this world void, but he created it to be inhabited. And then it became void. Uh, that's tuhu in the Hebrew. It means totally void. So Isaiah 45, 18 will help you with that. Tony from California. Thank you for you and your staff. You do bring Bible truth to, to God's people. Thank you. In the past, I have studied with another Christian organization who believed the Antichrist is a man who may be here now. I think they get this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and Revelation 13, 18, where the Antichrist is referred to as a man. Why do those uh, passages refer to the Antichrist as a man? Well, um, because he is. Who were we made in the image of? Let us make man in our image. What does, what does the word Gabriel mean? I mean, this is an archangel. What does the word Gabriel mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means man of God. And when, when you quote 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it's addressed to one specific anthropos, that's man. It's the son of perdition. There's only one. You'll find who it is in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. It's Satan. So, yeah, he's referred to as a man, and, uh, and so it is. Uh, but it's Satan himself. Okay. When, uh, let me give you another one. Isaiah chapter 14. When, O Lucifer, son of the morning, why is it you have fallen from heaven up onto the earth? And he was cast into a pit. And the people of the earth would walk up to the abyss and say, Is this the man? Is this the ish that deceived the world? In other words, he's called a man. There's no, not, no problem with that. It's one specific one. The name's Satan, the devil, and, and so it, the old Antichrist. Merlin from Minnesota, a question for Pastor Murray. Please explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, it means exactly that. When you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, when the clay pot breaks, means you die, 
instantly your spirit, the intellect of your soul and your spiritual body returns to the Father. So naturally those that die go first because they're already gone. Okay. Now I know that some people make a religion out of saying the graves are going to open and that's a lie. We're through with these flesh bodies when at death because you've got a beautiful spiritual body that doesn't age, it doesn't wither, it doesn't get sick. You wouldn't want these things back. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says these flesh bodies go into the grave, turn back to dirt, and they're, they're never even remembered anymore. Dorothy from Kentucky. If you try to commit suicide and then realize it was wrong and ask for forgiveness, will God forgive me for that? I really need to know. Thank you. Well, of course, you didn't. it's forgivable because you didn't do it. But suicide is murder. And... Um, and naturally, murder, he wants to talk to murderers up there. And he says, send them up to me. So that would, then you might have, if you, if you had accomplished it, you might have something to be concerned about. But you didn't, so it's forgivable. Repent, go in peace, and sin no more. Uh, Darlene from New York. I'm, my beloved husband died January the 31st, 2012. Well, we're, we, we um, our sympathy to you. I really miss him and I'm having a difficult time getting through this. My question is, what do they do up in heaven? Do they eat, sleep, visit each other all day? Please help me to understand. My heart is breaking. Well, well rejoice now that he's with the Father. Read, read the 16th verse of the great chapter of Luke concerning the, the beggar, Lazarus, and the rich man. Lazarus, who loved the Lord, and I'm sure your husband did, because it's obvious you both study with the chapel and, and love the Lord, uh, he's, he's with, with the Father and, and with the rest of, um, uh, of God's children. And they are very happy. It tells you in Luke chapter 16, they're rejoicing right with Abraham and the other children. So uh, that's uh, naturally we grieve when we lose a loved one because half of you is gone. <clears throat> but um, time heals and uh, God has a purpose for him and for you. And you keep searching for that purpose and you'll do just fine, okay? Uh, Harold from Florida, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 8. What is a child doing in the millennium? It's a figure of speech. It means that it is so safe. Speaking of safety is what it means. It is so safe that a child could do that. Okay. You know, an adult, it would not have impl implicated the fact of safety as much if it was an adult because adults usually know how to handle a snake. Okay. But a child doesn't, they'll pick them up, right, necessarily. And um, it's simply a statement, we're all the same age in the millennium. Spiritual bodies are all the same age. And, um, and very, very healthy and usually very happy if you made it to the right side of the goal. Simply a statement uh, meaning safety. Mar Marie from Montana. What does the Bible say about predestination? Does God have a few chosen people he is going to save or is everyone going to have a chance to go to heaven? Everyone's got a chance to go to heaven. But, but he does have an election that he will interfere in their lives uh, to bring to pass the scripture as it is written. But most people have free will to love Christ, to find the word, and be servants of the living God. Not one is any better than the other. It's just that God's election, even when Satan rebelled in the beginning, they stood against him. He didn't snow them. And God knew he could trust them. You can read of predestination in Romans chapter 8, long about verse 26. He says, hey, you set aside ones. That's what a saint is. That's elect. You, you don't even know what to pray for. That's why I intercede in your lives because you are predestined, foreordained. Um, why? Because you earned it. It's not because you were the prettiest or anything of that nature. You earned it, and so it is given freely to by our Father. Ruth from Indiana. What country does the Antichrist come from? 
The Antichrist does not come from a country. The Antichrist comes from heaven. Uh, this, this is very difficult for some people to get a handle on because they say, well, what is the Antichrist doing in heaven? He's being helped there by Michael. Have, have you never read Revelation chapter 12? Where he is helped there. His evil spirit can traverse the earth. To and fro he can go. His evil spirit. But physically, he's locked in heaven. That's why Christ said, get behind me, and he is behind the throne locked. Who is he helped by? Well, the word tells you, Michael and his angels. And But there is a time coming very soon when Michael and his angels are going to cast Satan and his angels back down on earth. And they know they have but a short time, and that's when he comes playing Jesus. Only he's the false Jesus. He's not Christ. He's instead of Christ, which is called Antichrist. Uh, Rhonda from Georgia, if someone goes to the wrong side of the gulf, is there a chance to go back to the right side of the gulf before the end? No, there isn't. But there is the millennium. If we were to call, if you, if you call the end of this earth age, then that would be one thing. But by the end of the millennium, they will have an opportunity. Through the millennium, if they had, if they had, um, no opportunity to really know the truth, uh, then there will be many saved during the millennium. I know that, that a lot of people resent that, but it's true. Uh, that's why God would not foolishly have a thousand year period if there wasn't teaching there. Well, how can you document there's teaching? Uh, Revelation 20, verse 5, God's elect are priest with Christ for a thousand years. Well, what do priests do? They teach. They teach God's Word. Uh, they will teach discipline mostly in the millennium because in spiritual bodies, most of them will know what the Word is, but uh, there will be a lot of them lacking discipline. Uh, all will have a chance in a spiritual body to decide whether they love God or whether they're going to follow Satan. Those that choose Satan in the end will go into the abyss with him, that is to say the lake of fire. God is a consuming fire. Michael from South Carolina. What scripture says the gulf in heaven where God and Abraham are on one side? The scripture is Luke 16. It seems like we're having that come up quite a bit today. Luke 16. It is a parable that's a little unusual because it's written about two actual men. A parable about two actual men who both died and went to paradise. Why did Christ teach that? So that we would know what happens in paradise. So we know kind of what people do in paradise or uh, paradise is a part of heaven, okay? And um, I, I think I have a work called the Gardens of God. That means the paradises and different spots of God's word. Jim from California. In Matthew, it says when two people are working in a field, one will be taken up. The, is the one taken up to heaven and the other staying to fight? Is uh, one taken by Antichrist? The whole subject. Always when you're studying, watch the subject, watch the article. What is being discussed in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when one is taken? The fact that the Antichrist comes first and that you're delivered up before him. It's the greatest tribulation since the beginning of time is Satan on earth with his fallen angels. And many are going to be taken by him. <clears throat> but you are to stay in the field working. Uh, the one taken, unfortunately, is taken by Antichrist. There, there's many that teach you're going to fly away. You, don't, you won't be here in the tribulation. And unfortunately, that's kind of the message that the Antichrist brings forth. This is why Paul wrote chapter 2 in 2 Thessalonians because the first book concerning the so-called gathering back to Christ deceived a lot of people. <clears throat> so he wrote in chapter 2, I want to talk to you about our getting back to Christ. It's not going to happen. Don't let my first letter, don't let some spirit or man tell you any different 
Christ is not returning until after the son of perdition, that Satan, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. You're going to live through that if you live in this generation of the fig tree. But uh, that's all right. We can cut it. There's no problem whatsoever. Elliot from Ohio. Will you please explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18? My church believes in the rapture, but I don't. Thank you. A lot of time for this today, huh? Well, verse 13 says, If you believe Christ uh, rose from the dead, you better believe all the others that believe upon him have risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. And then it goes on to say that those that the, the, the dead rise first, why they're already with him, but at the seventh trump, not the sixth when the Antichrist comes, but at the seventh trump, we will all meet him in spiritual bodies, quite frankly, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In the wink of an eye, at the sound of the farthest trump out, that's the seventh, um, then we will gather. Otherwise, we're going through Antichrist's reign. You can count on it. That's why I told you, you're saying 1 Thessalonians. That's why I said you should read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul uh, straightens this situation out. And we be out of time, so I say to you, studying God's Word, I love you for that, but most important, God loves you for it. It makes his day when you read the letter he sent to you and let him know you love him. It makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. Father loves his children that study the letter. Now, uh, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, again, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.